All right. Um, let me go ahead and just um, start here. So I haven't had anybody join me yet uh, for this morning session. So I, so I thought I'd talk a little bit though about uh, the assignment six for this week. Um, so um, our, our materials this week, we're looking at the analysis of algorithms and talking about computational complexity. So this is just kind of an important um, unit for um, our class here. So, you know, our, our class, our, our, our purpose of our class is to learn about data structures and to learn about um, algorithms, right? So, so learn about how to build data structures and then learn how to kind of compare their performance, right? So the fundamental thing about how you compare the performance of algorithms is, is by studying uh, their co computational complexity, right? So uh, the materials and the readings from this week uh, will introduce you to the topic. Um, and our assignment six then, um, um, I want to go ahead and talk about that. So I've already accepted the assignment here. Our assignment six um, um, is about um, doing some practical uh, examples of how you use the concepts uh, from you know computational complexity to analyze the performance of algorithms. All right, so. Um, um, I've already accepted the assignment, um, and um, um, you might want to actually read the PDF of the assignment this time when you're using the the you know if, when you're reading through the assignment description, because uh, there is some mathematical notation on there. Um, although hopefully this won't um, um, uh, scare anybody away because it's not too simple. So I thought I'd go over that uh, just to make certain everybody understands what we're doing here. Um, I suspect people will find this assignment um, easier than the last one, or actually the last couple. So we're actually not doing any, um, any um, memory management. So we're not dynamically allocating memory, which is always tough when you do it for the first time for in any um, kind of uh, real way, uh, because it's very easy as people have found out to um, inadvertently go past the end of an array or, or um, you know, incorrectly allocate something. So, um, so yeah, we're not doing dynamic allocation this week. We are going to be doing some recursion still. Um, and in this, this um, assignment six, uh, we're only writing regular uh, C functions again. So we're not working with classes. Okay. And you only have to write four functions. So, so um, but, uh, but yeah, I hope, I hope that um, you, know, you really should spend some time reading the assigned textbook readings and watching the, the, the lecture videos from me. So it's, it's very important that you do those kind of first um, and understand the basics of computational complexity. Mm -hmm. okay? So we're gonna be writing actually four functions uh, that, and the, the four functions are gonna have a different um, computational um, you know, uh, uh, complexity. So, so different performance measures. So we'll, have a, we'll write a constant time function one that's linear in 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 so a big O of n, and we're going to write one that's exponential O big O uh, two to the power of n. Right. Um, so let me uh, make certain uh, everybody understands what we're doing here. We're going to be computing uh, numbers in the Fibonacci sequence. So if you haven't seen these before, so don't let this notation. Um, scare you off, um, it's relatively simple, all right? So the, 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 it, the, the next Fibonacci number you find by just adding up the two previous Fibonacci numbers in the sequence. So these three things here define what's known as a sequence of values, all right? Um, and by convention, usually we define that the zeroth Fibonacci number in the sequence is defined to be zero. And, and the, the first Fibonacci, so F1 or Fibonacci one um, is defined to be one. And so there's, there's no two previous numbers to either of these. So we have to have, these are known as initial conditions of the sequence. And then from that, you know, so, so we can, we can uh, calculate the second Fibonacci number F2 because we have F1 and F0. So if we just add up F1 and F0, we get one, right? So, so the second Fibonacci number is just the addition of the previous two is one. The third one is one plus one, which is two. Fourth Fibonacci is two plus one, which is three, and so on. Right? The tenth Fibonacci number is thirty-four plus twenty-one because the ninth and eighth were as shown here, um, and so it's fifty-five. Then the eleventh is eighty-nine, the twelfth is one forty-four. Okay. Um, so we're actually going to be computing. Uh, we're going. You, you're going to be writing four functions in this assignment. 
uh, where you're given in. So, so if I ask you to calculate the, um, the, the, the third Fibonacci number, so if I pass in, in is three, you have to re return two because two is the third Fibonacci number in the sequence where we start uh, at zero. So, so this is the zeroth number, first number, second number, third number, right? So all the functions you write are gonna be computing the, you know, you're, you're asked to compute the nth Fibonacci number and you compute it and return it. But we're gonna compute it in four different ways that have examples of four different um, computational complexity um, in this assignment. Um, all right. Um, oh, by the way, um, one final thing before I kind of get in and show you how to get started on this. Um, the, um, the, the, the Fibonacci sequence is an example of exponential growth. So it's maybe a little bit tough to see this from the first uh, 12 numbers I give you in the sequence, but it, it begins to increase very rapidly, very quickly here, right? So they get very big, very quickly um, because they, they grow essentially exponentially. So um, they actually don't quite grow to the two to the power of n. Um, and uh, you'll, when you get into the, the guts of this assignment, you'll find out maybe why it's more like 1.6 to the power of n, but, but that's still an exponential growth. So anything to the power of n is an exponential growth. Um, so that has a big O of like two to the n, which is what we normally think of. One to the n isn't exponential because one to any power is one. So one to the n would just be a, a, a constant O1. But anything above one grows exponentially. So 1.1 to the n is actually uh, a slower exponential growth than to the end, but still an exponential growth. So at some point it'll take off and, and, and become very rapid. And that happens in the case here. So in fact, we're gonna be using just regular 32-bit integers. So at the int type in your dev box and normally by default uses 32 bits to represent an integer, All right? If you didn't know that. Um, and, and we usually use signed integers. Um, we can use unsigned integers, but but we didn't, we didn't um, bother with it for this assignment because the one extra bit doesn't gain a whole lot here. So anyway, if you use a signed integer, you actually have to use one bit for the plus or minus to represent whether it's positive or negative. That means you have 31 bits to represent the magnitude. That means that you actually have an upper limit of a, a, a bit over 2 billion that you can represent. And so that's the maximum number you can represent with a standard int type in C and C++, right? And uh, the, the 46th Fibonacci number is less than that. It's, it's 1 billion, 836 million. Um, so it fits. But F47 um, overflows that. So F47 is too big. It's, it's, it's bigger than the, the 2 billion, 147 million, right? So we can only effectively calculate uh, uh, in, you know, the, uh, in from zero to, to 46 in this assignment. So. Um, although I don't ask you to do any error checking or throw any exceptions on this assignment this time, so that, that also might make it a little bit easier. So you, you can just, you don't have to do any error checking. You can just assume that n will always be some number between zero and 46 inclusive for your functions that you're writing for the assignment. All right. Um, all right, so as usual, let me go ahead and um, own this repository and, and uh, get the um, um, uh, steps set up here. So, let's see here. I don't remember if I started up my dev box successfully or not. Um, yes. Open the big one up. I mean, it looks like I've got my full ribbon shared and yeah, using the status, it is running. So we should be able to um, some things here. We'll be able to get into my dev box at the normal place at so the 127 port um, 8080. Uh, let's close off this folder here. I got from actually the last assignment still open. Um, all right, so um, oh, let's, um, 
let me just check the steps again. So I always good to have checklists for these kinds of things so you don't forget anything. So I've already um, accepted the assignment and, and copied the assignment repository in GitHub. Um, so let's clone the repository like it says. And as usual, I'll put it into my sync assignments folder in this case. And let's open it up. Um, so you're going to be putting all your code into the libfibonacci.cpp and libfibonacci.hpp files um, this time. Um, but um, let's see, uh, let's, let's run our project configuration. Um, I mean, I need people to, to check again that their IntelliSense is running and that you've got the 1.5.1. .1. Right. Um, and, um, you know, until you run the configure, uh, you will get this pop up that um, um, that something is missing because it configures where to find the headers. Right. Uh, but um, um, I, I still have some people that, that don't seem to have the correct IntelliSense um, uh, extension installed um, and, you know, and therefore aren't running the, the, the style checker and formatter. On the files, right? So, for one thing, if you haven't run the configure, um, it's going to complain about um, uh, that it can't find the catch.hpp because that's one of the things that we configure where to find this file when you run your project configuration. So, um, again, hopefully everybody's familiar with this by now. Uh, but um, if you already have your project folder open and you open a terminal, it'll open you up into that directory, which is where you want to be. So, you can do the got, dot slash configure. Um, and this has the effect of it actually creates copies over a VS code directory, which does a bunch of configuration um, for the keyboard bindings and setting up the build system. And it should copy over the CLAN format. Um, so in particular, again, you, you can check this. So for example, if I have a open curly brace at the end of a line, um, and if you do a save, it should resave those and it should re indent your code, uh, line up the curly braces correctly. So the first block level should go at index zero, second block level. So um, any, any blocks at the next level would go two spaces over. Uh, the, block, uh, the first indented block is at two spaces and then four spaces and six spaces and so on. Um, but that's an easy way to check, you know, so, so make certain that it is running. Uh, and another thing, you know, you should be able to do the um, um, control shift one um, once you've run the configure to do a make clean control shift two um, should build, uh, oh, the, but I had commented, so we're not going to build uh, right now, but by commenting that back out, we'll, we'll build. So um, let me go ahead and um, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and give this to you. Uh, but in this case, I mean, you're writing four functions. So one called Fibonacci linear, one called